Welcome to Diffuse Congruence. This is episode 113 of the American Muslim Experience, and I am Prabez Ahmad, and joined as always by my co-host Omar Ansari. Hey, Omar. Hey, Assalamualaikum Prabez, Assalamualaikum listeners. Uh, good to be good to be back. Yeah, great to be back, and uh, good good to be, uh, be able to catch up with you as well. Um, so, latest and greatest. Uh, let's see. Uh, Kind of wanna. It's been a couple of weeks since we've been uh, back in front of the audience. Uh, we've got we got great responses from our last episode, and uh, about with Celine Ibrahim. And mm-hmm. so thank you as always for that wonderful feedback that you do send our way. Um, yeah. Well, what else? You want I don't know if you have anything to catch up our listeners on or. Well, just that you know things are in full swing in terms of economy reopening and yeah. kids are out of school and we're, we're, we're going to theme parks. We're going to pools. We're going out mask in some cases. <laughs> My daughter insisted on taking her mask off even in the grocery store. And I was like, fine, take your mask off as, as if she was like, you know, wearing like super short shorts or something. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, no, something I, inappropriate. I, I don't know. If, no, it's it's funny you say that because you, there is a part of you that almost feels sort of naked, quote unquote, without yeah, it, right? Yeah. So uh, it took me a minute too to be able to, because I I can't tell you how many times in the pen, during the pandemic or well, I mean we're still you know whatever, but but in the in, when it was the worst of it, where I would be walking into a store and I'd be like, whoops, I forgot my mask and have to run back to the car. And now I'm like, oh, whoops, I forgot my mask. Oh, I don't need a mask if I don't want to, you know. And so mm-hmm. I've been, yeah, I've been, you know, vaccinated now, obviously, for a few few months. And uh, been, uh, yeah, getting getting back out there and going to places uh, that are, are where other people are also maskless. So um, that's going well. And I'm also back in the office where um, they that's also huge. updated. Yeah, that's been great. I, I'm actually... I started this job during the pandemic, and so I had never been into the office, so to speak. Um, and so it's, it's nice to be at a new company, new place, new desk. Um, Cal OSHA just uh, updated their compliance, so it's in synchronicity with uh, the overall national CDC. So now they're saying that if you're vaccinated inside the office, you don't need to be masked. So mm-hmm. that's also exciting where I don't have to wear a mask for you know, seven, eight days, uh, seven, eight fun. hours out of the day. Yeah, that, that's just, that wasn't fun. Well, I'll, I'll, I'll one up you on going to a, a, a Jeremy place without a mask. I joined a gym. I, <laughs> Whoa! Yeah, yeah. And, and I, so I joined CrossFit. Have you heard of this? Of course I have. Yeah. You're going to be, you're going to become a CrossFit cultist. I can already, <laughs> I can already predict because you know, it's a little, it's a little mini cult. I yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I actually didn't do too much research. I was just like, you know what? I'm going to do it. A friend of mine, well, well, then kind you're of, a typical new cult member then. You know, you didn't do the research. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're good things, and now here you are, right? <laughs> I'll be handing out flyers for it soon, I'm sure. Uh, and yeah, no, a friend of mine just judged me into it, and he's, he's been doing it for a couple of years. I was like, okay, you know what? Let me try it out. So, so what's uh, – now, I know I think gyms in California are saying they don't they don't require a mask anymore. Is that is that what CrossFit's saying? I mean, it's in a warehouse and they leave the like the garage door open. So totally. technically it's got fresh air. So, um, but yeah, no masks. Yeah. Well, that's awesome, dude. You were going to become a beefcake. Uh, Cause I know people who've done it and have a, just had great success stories. So I, I don't know what beef for you. means, but I'm going to stay with something <laughs> positive. No, dude, you're going to become like Mr. Buff. Sorry. I know beefcake is probably like a super 80s term that I don't know why popped into my head. That's um, hilarious. But no, you're gonna be okay. As the young kids say, you're gonna be swole. I, I don't even know if that's current. So you you went too old and then too new. I'm guess I'm somewhere stuck in the middle, right? I went like full boomer. Yeah, and now yeah, I probably yeah. sound like a boomer too because they don't say swole anymore. Yeah, exactly. But anyway, uh, no, that's all. You know, all, all that's great, dude. I I there's a there's there's something like CrossFit that I've been eye, eyeballing for a while. Uh, in fact, I had looked into it right before the pandemic, and then of course the pandemic, and I decided to. But now I'm actually yeah rethinking it again, so it's uh, it's called round nine, and so it's 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 boxing, so it's all boxing, and you come in, you do a circuit, so it's very CrossFit ish. You come in, do circuits at your own pace, and then you're out. So you mm-hmm. come in, use the gym whenever you want, and then you leave. But they have these like stations, kind of like circuits, very similar to what CrossFit will introduce you to if you haven't already checked it out. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you kind of do it at your own pace and you're out, you know, so that's kind of the the objective. Nice. But um, in the case of round nine, it's all uh, it's all boxing related. Yeah. 
That's awesome. Yeah. That's great. Yeah, so yeah, yeah, we'll we'll we'll, uh, we'll do a weigh, a weigh in, in in a month yeah, or two. Yeah. So anyway, I mean, I I don't want to keep our audience waiting, but I think before we uh, dive right in with our guest, uh, I I do want to kind of also situate us with what's happening in the news. Uh, for those who keep up with these kinds of things, um, Muslim Advocates uh, has uh, been in the news recently. Uh, for those that are familiar with Muslim Advocates, it's a Muslim advocacy group uh, based here, actually, as it were, in the Bay Area. Uh, and, uh, yeah, they got hit with a little bit of a controversy or, or so, there's again, some news or they're in the news, I should say, and not for all the right reasons. Uh, there was a parting of the ways between their founding director, their founding member and director for Hana, for Hana, uh, care, is it right? For Hana, for Hana yeah. Kara, yeah. For Hana Kara, uh, and the board essentially decided to part ways, uh, so I guess, I don't know if Omar, if you want to kind of walk through the timeline of, of what happened and, and, and there's a reason for this, um, uh, you know, listeners, I want to, uh, and I'll come back to why we're doing this, but, uh, Omar, if you want to quickly just catch maybe I mean, listeners just, who aren't just, familiar. Just in so far as I've been briefly following it, um, it sounds like there's some accusations and the board looked into it and ultimately that led to the resignation of the director uh, and then there was uh, some new folks in charge, basically playing cleanup. And um, and at the same time, it sounds like now there's some litigation going on. So that's that's the high level. Um, again, just reading, finding out on the periphery. I mean, I, I know kind of people involved in every party, and they're all wonderful people. As far as I, you know, as far as some I know better than others, some I know very well. Um, so uh, you know, I'm kind of just watching from afar and hoping it all works out. Uh, yeah, but, yeah. but I know there's a bigger issue that is kind of close to your heart. So maybe, maybe it's you talk. Yeah. About it. and, and thank you Umar, for raising that because again, again, listeners, you guys know, I mean, you all know that we don't like to talk about, you know, controversy for the sake of like the salacious details. That's just not ever been our show. Um, but to me, the reason I even bring it up, the, the issue with Muslim advocates is because it, it, it strikes to, well, it struck at, for me, it struck close to home it's Bay Area. It's you know, it's a Bay Area nonprofit um, that is uh, that is dealing with accusations of abuse, toxic work environment. Um, you know, brought on primarily by the founding director and people in leadership. And for those of you who know or you know kept listening to the show long enough, know that me, Pervez Ahmed. You know, there was a similar situation that rose um, that arose a couple of years ago with Talif, Talif Collective, which I still serve on the board of. Um, and we had a similar, you know, issue sort of come up, and we had to deal with accusations. And so, and it was a place very, um, alhamdulillah, like no litigation resulted uh, by virtue of the parting of the ways between the organization slash board and its founding director. Um, but as I, I, what I say, you know, the, and the reason I bring up, as I said, not only because it hits close to home, but I think it, it points to broader issues that we're beginning to see more and more of, right? I mean, Muslim advocates, nor Talif Collective, you know, these are not organizations that are the first to be, um, to be in the public eye due to controversy surrounding accusations of abuse, accusations of toxicity or the work environment, et cetera, you know? And so I think that my purpose in raising it or our purpose in raising it is, you know, we just want to have a conversation. I think the community needs uh, platforms and venues where we can have open and honest dialogue about these, about these issues. And so uh, my intent, inshallah, our intent as a show is to do, you know, dedicate an entire future episode uh, not to the details of what transpired at Talif, nor to the details of what transpired at Muslim Advocates, but rather kind of a broader conversation around best practices for Muslim, you know, non, uh, sorry, Muslim nonprofits, uh, you know, think out for, uh, you know, again, those type of issues that I think are far more interesting to me than the salaciousness of any particular uh, instance. Oh, you know, hello, and, and yeah. I'm in HR. Uh, I don't know if I've said that before. Um, right. So, um, I mean, I don't do, I deal more on the technical and operational side, but I will say that um, in my 23 years in Silicon Valley, I've seen, um, and, and everybody knows this already, there's been a much bigger attention to um, making everybody feel comfortable, employee, employee um, 
employee rights and experience, I should say, diversity and inclusion, all these things to prevent a toxic workplace. I mean, I don't hear F-bombs from my VP like I used to 15 years ago, just as an example, right? Um, I don't, you don't get, um, you know, you don't get the toxic behavior as much. I mean, it's still there, but people are trying to move away from that. And I think this calls to attention that Muslim organizations have to move in that direction and keep up with the changing times. Um, and pay attention just as much to discrimination, worker experience, uh, worker rights, all those things that any organization yeah, can pay and attention I think two, to. Muslim organizations know, two have two to things come up. to mind. One, I, I, I appreciate what you point out, that this isn't something that's you know systemic to nor limited to Muslim organizations. I mean, certainly, whether it's religious or secular, co- corporate or otherwise, we see these type of instances come up time and time again. So this is not limited to religious organizations, nor is it li- limited to uh, you know, the Muslim community. So uh, thank you for raising that. Number two, what I think the Muslim advocates issue raised for me as, as again, someone who's involved in the Muslim nonprofit space is that gender is also not necessarily a preclusion or something that is going to inoculate, i.e., and by that I mean, you know, women in leadership or, you know, a, even a diverse leadership um, uh, that's going to necessarily inoculate an organization um, from these type of issues. So it's not limited to, again, religion, not limited to gender, ethnicity, and so on. So. Like I said, so to me, all of this just is, is, is a way of just mm-hmm. telling our listeners, look, there's, I think, a broader issue here that needs to be teased and talked about and uh, sorry, teased out and talked about and fleshed out in detail. And, uh, you know, we plan on doing that, um, like I said, and not not so much about the uh, the sort of, you know, like I said, salacious nature or the salacious details of any particular um, instance that comes to mind. Yeah, Pervez, I, I am going to have to step out. Uh, I know I've mentioned on the show that I have a couple of daughters, two daughters, and we're trying to keep them super active this summer. So I do have a commitment I couldn't get out of. Um, and I will be stepping out and leaving our two guests in, in your hands. And speaking of our two guests, we are super excited to have the film team of Two Gods here today, uh, Zishan and Aman Ali. Um, the movie is Two Gods, and they're, they're the producers and uh, directors of, the, of, the, of this film. Uh, the director is Zishan. He's originally from Ohio and a graduate of the Tisch School of Arts at NYU. This is his first feature film, and he's received support from ITVS, Tribeca Film Institute, Ford Foundation, Sundance Institute, Doc Society, Points North Institute, and IFP. He's a member of the Brooklyn Filmmakers Collective and Meerkat Media, and he's currently based in New York. And his brother, Aman, is the producer. Aman's an award-winning storyteller, also in New York. He's made appearances in a bunch of media outlet, media outlets, the New York Times, BuzzFeed, CNN, HBO, NPR. And he first gained fame for being the co-creator of the social media phenomenon, 30 Mosques in 30 Days, if you remember that. That was a 25,000-mile road trip he took to all 50 states and had um, the mission of telling groundbreaking stories uh, about Muslims in America in that, um, in that content. So super excited to have the film team of Two Gods here. Uh, to talk about the film that they made. It's a great film. Uh, we'll be talking about it in detail. Yeah, so we are absolutely excited to have Aman and Zishan join us and uh, super excited to get into the documentary. Um, but I guess before we uh, dive right into the documentary, fellows, I would uh, love to get to know you guys a little bit more. Uh, so no no, no uh, secret, Zishan and Aman are brothers, although you might be joining us from two separate locations. Is that is that correct? Okay. All right. Yep, and that's, different that's the East Coast, right? You guys are both in New York? New York City, yeah, all the way City. to the Bay Area, City, yep. so coast to coast. Um, well, it's it's a real honor. It's a real pleasure. Uh, Aman, I have long followed your work. Uh, the content you've put out there for several years, the comedy. Uh, Zishan, you're uh, brand new to me uh, with this film, but uh, I, I'd love to, 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 to uh, get to know you as well. But uh, yeah, I guess, like I said, to kind of dive right in, we uh, often like to kind of uh, tee things off uh, by doing a dive into y'all's origin story. Where do you hail from? Tell us about your background. Uh, That'd be great. Yeah. So yeah, this is Aman. And um, we, uh, Zisha and I, we were born and raised um, right outside of uh, Columbus, Ohio. 
Um, and at the time, um, pre at the time it was like a fairly predominant white town. So like very many Muslims in this country, like, you know, uh, person, one of the only person of color in town, that kind of thing. And I think for us, like many Muslim kids that we just, we're just really frustrated with not seeing people that look like us in TV and in cinema. And it was always something that we just constantly were talking about. And when we watched films and watched TV shows and there was a particular Muslim character or even a South Asian character or anything like that, it just always came up and we always just, you know, pick things apart and we just get really frustrated. And I think as we got older, we wanted to uh, do something about that frustration instead of just critiquing saying, I don't like this. I don't like the writing of this. They should have gotten this and got that. We both naturally were just gravitated towards this path um, saying, let's do something about it. I went uh, more of a uh, journalism route. Uh, so I went to journal school. Uh, I worked as a reporter. Um, and I just constantly was finding myself having to explain who I was, um, that it naturally led to me being a person on stage as a performer and wanting to not only explain my narrative, but explain, um, or not explain other people's narratives, but give other people platforms to share their narratives uh, as well. Um, and so, yeah, I was just always that person that just got so frustrated with not feeling seen that I wanted to, instead of having other people tell my story, um, I wanted to not only create a platform to tell my own story, uh, but also create a platform to tell uh, other people's stories uh, as well. And Zishan, you want to... Yeah, I'm yours. wondering the similarities of the differences. Yeah, I mean, certainly hailing from Ohio, I imagine that being the same. But I mean, if you could maybe even take take us back a little bit further, if you don't mind, uh, where do your parents, uh, like, where did they immigrate from? Was it kind of the late 60s, 70s immigration story a la myself and Omar or slightly different? Yeah, I mean, our parents came to the um, to the States from India in the early to mid seventies, um, you know, our father was, a you know, an engineer in India came to the States and, um, you know, actually kind of through a series of many just very strange life detours started working at a bakery. Um, so our father worked as, um, kind of working in bakeries and donut stores, um, in the Midwest and then settled in Ohio. Um, and that's where our, um, Aman and I were born. So it was a very sort of random series of events that our parents actually ended up in Ohio because first they were in Chicago for a while, kind of in a very heavy immigrant sort of Indian Muslim community. And then they came to Ohio where they were very much like, what did we do? What did we do? Um, there's no, like my mom always kind of reflects on that time where she was just like, uh, there were many nights where she woke up and she was like, what, what am I doing here? Um, you know, just like has a, you know, a little family of children and just no one else around her that looked like that. So it was a very sort of like quiet upbringing. I will say like Ohio was a very, it's so different now, but when we were there and growing up, um, now it's like actually quite diverse. But when we were there, it was just a very sort of like small town, quiet lifestyle. Um, very much like there was a cohort of Muslim community and like an immigrant community. And we kind of latched onto that. Like we spent all of our weekends at families' houses and we had cousins that lived near us. So we just spent a lot of time with family and, you know, in, a, in the mosque and the Muslim community as much as we could. And I think that really kind of shaped our um, perspective um, to kind of like constantly have that sort of community that we were always seeking out in some sort of way. Yeah, and probably not just perspective, but your your identity probably became. I mean, I don't want to presume. I'm just speaking from my own experience uh, growing up in a similar environment. Uh, the, your Islamic identity kind of came out to the to the forefront. Is in in my case, especially because those weekend activities were filled not just with Indian Pakistani families, but with like Bosnian families or uh, Lebanese families or Iraqi families and so on and so forth. Right. So the common thread was your Islamic identity. And, and so, and, and, and therefore, you know, when you see somebody on the screen going full circle, uh, that really resonates or, or irks you, I should say, if it's not presented in, in, in a, in an accurate way. 
No, that's a, absolutely what it was. Um, it's uh, we, um, yeah. Even calling myself yeah. Indian, like this feels weird um, because I'm used to growing in a community in my friend circle. Um, yes, that happened to be Muslim, but we're from you know many different parts of the world, and so it's hard for me to like even see myself. When people point it out, I'm like, oh yeah, I forgot I'm Indian. I'm like, oh yeah, I'm, my family's uh, you know from there. But yeah, that I mean, very similar. It was that was. Because exactly. just purely by numbers, because there weren't that many at the time, many Muslim families, we all kind of gravitated towards uh, together. And the mosque was kind of like our country club. That was the place we went to on weekends to hang out and spend time with people. And yeah, it was that rallying point for people from all over the city that went to all these different schools coming from all different parts of the world. Yeah, you know, the, uh, to come I together. Think- I, I was just going to say, and what, what were, yeah, yeah go well, ahead. I'm just going to yeah, ask, Rebez. Uh, what were, yeah, I was just going to say, what were some of the um, annoying movies that you did or, or shows, movies, any content you saw that stuck out at you? I mean, obviously, True Lies comes to mind, right? But anything anything you remember that really, really irked, bothered I, you? I mean, there's so many. Um, the Simpsons, um, kids used to call me a poo all the time. Aladdin, I was called a boo. Um, so I just, I hate the Aladdin just for that reason. But um uh, and then there was just, it, it wasn't even just particular shows or movies. There would be like a character or just one little moment or a commercial where like, you know, it's always the nerdy kid or whomever, like even, um, this is way back, oh, yeah, sure. uh, short circuit. I don't know if you remember that movie, the guy who built the robot and it's a white guy playing an Indian guy. And I was just like, what is, you couldn't find one Indian actor. There's 1.6 billion people and you couldn't find one person to play an engineer like really i can go down to your local college <laughs> and find four thousand of them um so i would just get really annoyed at like little things like uh and honestly like that stuff still happens we we talk about all this great progress and all this multiculturalism but a lot of ignorant stuff still happens you know thankfully we have a voice and we can make noise about it and hold people accountable um but these frustrations didn't end uh with black panther you know people think oh yeah black panther came out and everything's good now no it's still an issue we'll tell you from experience like it's still like it, yes it's gotten so much better uh yeah but we still have a long way to absolutely go. no no go ahead zishan i also oh go ahead i was gonna say like i also think that if you grow up in a small town of a certain time like there's not really like much sort of like cultural competency so like rarely did i actually was i identified as being indian or muslim i was just like vaguely ethnic so i found myself just like you know bothered by all marginalized representation it was like if i saw a film or movie or a tv show it was like if anybody was being caricaturized in some way i would get upset because half the time people didn't know if i was um you know asian or south american or middle eastern it was like they didn't know what to peg me i was just brown like I was just like a brown face. So like any sort of weird or like unhelpful sort of like representation of a brown face, I found myself sort of being very bothered by um, because it, inevitably it would come back to sometimes at school and like the playground, you'd get called like insults. And as a kid, your first response is like, wait, like I, I don't speak Spanish. <laughs> like, like, why are they like, why are they, why am I being insulted in that sort of way? It was like, Oh, it, it like never made sense. It was like, wait, no, I'm Indian, everyone. And it's just like kind of crickets. Like it was just like, okay, whatever. Like, you mm-hmm. know, so I think a lot of times of like growing up, we were, it was the Apus. It was the sort of like, you know, but it was also like, you know, anytime we saw any person of color on screen that was represented, it had harm on us. It had a ripple effect. Like whether, especially something that was very popular, especially shows that were kind of like, being talked about and watched like a lot like it was like it somehow would find a way to kind of like circle back to us in some sort of way and I think that was like where we started to kind of realize that like film and television had such important dictation of like our cultural vocabulary even at a very young age okay that's that's yeah I, I like I said I can totally well, relate to that actually sure I can't. Can as well and you that's become the kind thing. of a like I mean because my spokesman. like my experiences are so oh, different yeah? and that's what I was been trying to sort of chime in because I grew up in a kind of a big city I grew up in Houston and uh so relatively diverse I mean, although it's gotten way more diverse than it was in the 70s and 80s but but you know relatively diverse even back then 
And unlike you three, um, you know, growing up in a large Muslim community where people had the luxury to divide along ethnic lines, um, you know, the mosque I happened to go to was relatively homogenous. So unlike your experiences of interacting with Bosnian families, Iraqi families, and so on, um, I didn't have that. Uh, my experiences were in the, even within the Muslim community, um, you know, relatively homogenous. So grew up around mostly desis like myself. So uh, it was more about being able to navigate between those two spaces. That is to say, going from a space that was relatively homogenous, uh, the Muslim community, like you said, Sunday, you know, Sunday school, weekend, country club for all of us too. But then having to then go back to school on Monday and being in a space that was you know, uh, not homogenous, that was, uh, you know, uh, more diverse and more multicultural. Uh, although, you know, certainly I can relate to experiences of being, if not the only, maybe not the only brown kid or, or the only Indian or only Muslim in a classroom, but I can be maybe one of few. Um, and, and, you know, certainly questions like, okay, you're Indian, but what kind of Indian, you know, 7-Eleven or, you know, TP, right? So like just derogatory things like that. So, um, and and uh, going back to your question, Omar, about, you know, bad representation, like I'm of the vintage where for me, like a movie like Delta Force was traumatizing, right? Because that was like, you know, that was that, that was me in the 80s and having to kind of negotiate that. So anyway, but uh, I, I find it fascinating because I think that so much of what you two or three of you have shared, um, but specifically Aman and Zishan, I think relate to the work uh, and your art and your content. Um, you know, and, and we heard from Aman uh, Zishan um, in terms of the route he took via journalism. Um, how about yourself? Like, did you pursue filmmaking? Did you also, you know, how did you go about like your career choice? Yeah, it was very, um, it was kind of unplanned. Like, I think even though I watched films a lot growing up, I think a lot of people were very, my a lot of people were very surprised when I like showed up as an 18 year old and I was like, I'm going to move to New York and study film. Um, because, um, I was very sort of like discreet about my art. Like I, I rarely shared my art with anybody. Like I was, I was really into photography and writing, but it was all stuff that I just did like kind of behind the scenes. Um, I did like the usual high school stuff like theater and like took art classes and stuff. So like, my family had some barometer of like, all right, he's definitely like not going to be a doctor and he's going to give us a headache of some sort, but they just didn't understand like what I was going to be interested in. And I think for me, I really resonated with the visual storytelling. Like I think I really found when I found photography, that was like a really sort of like light bulb moment for me where I was able to kind of like capture things. Interestingly, like I never would have thought documentary would have been in the cards, but now I understand like it's actually kind of a perfect fit. I think mm. I'm the youngest of five children. And I think anyone who's the youngest in the family, like are natural sort of like observers of sorts. Like I'm very sort of like a quiet presence in a room. I, I rarely like to sort of take up space or like talk a lot. Like I, I kind of just disappear into the background. And it's actually like one of the the best things you can do in a documentary film. It's like you have a camera and you're just observing. And I was on, I was constantly doing that with my photography so that when I, when I went to film school, um, I, I actually really struggled in film school. I was a kind of like an outsider in that sense, because I never really liked the idea of like being on a set and like shouting commands out or like doing a ton of rehearsals or like writing a script and like that part of it never clicked for me it was the camera work like I was always sort of gravitating towards holding a camera quietly shooting something even the things that I shot like kind of never really made sense to my professors and then when I started working with Amon when I graduated I think was really when I sort of started to understand like this fits my personality and my craft. Like it fits both um, really nicely. Yeah, and I'm the opposite. I want to share my art with everybody. I'm like, you look at what I just painted. I want to talk. I want to take up all the space. <laughs> like that's what I do. So that, that's and, and we we're looking at a uh, Muhammad Ali. Yes. Uh, it sounds like you painted that. That's, yeah. That's, if you did, that's pretty cool. Thank you. Nice. I tell um, Aman. Tell us about. Um, you said that you. Um, you got into performing. Um, tell us a little about some of your early experiences uh, in, in that area. 
Yeah, no, and, and it's I yeah to piggyback off what Parvez was saying earlier about the almost the cultural bubbles that were starting to form in Houston. Actually, something similar happened when growing up because initially in the in like mid '80s, early '90s, it was fairly multicultural. But as more people started coming, people started spreading out and forming their own little cultural bubbles. And so our mosque, which became was start off as multicultural, slowly started to become more and more South Asian, and then. Middle Eastern folks started their own masjid, and then the Somali community started their own masjid, this and that. And I'll never forget this. Um, I was organizing a basketball tournament. I think I was 13, and with a bunch of friends, and we were trying to play basketball with some of the other mosques. And I was telling my mom about it, and my mom very innocently said, uh, why are you having the tournament there? That's the Arab mosque. She wasn't being racist or anything like that. She was just like, that's their spot. This is ours. And my 13-year-old brain just did not know how to compute, like, comprehend that. I'm like, I don't understand. Even to this day, I don't understand what that means. And I'm glad I don't. Um, so I was just always that person that just loved to just check things out, go talk to people, go meet people. My dad, um, as my brother mentioned, was a baker. And as he got older uh, in his career, started traveling a lot and going all over the country. And we used to go on road trips with him. So I, I was just always a very curious exploratory pe person and just loved going up to strangers and talking and so uh it was just a natural fit for me um to become a performer um and not only just getting on stage and, and, and you know telling my story but then talking to the audience and then traveling and hanging out with people and hearing their stories and using a platform for that um uh, but yeah it came from um just a just a curiosity you know I, I, like it's been the first of or this show is kind of the first of a few things uh for the first time we've had two guests that are brothers so you know you guys uh check that box and then like having a father who was a baker that just sounds like a fascinating experience See, uh, like an engineer turned baker nonetheless so uh, that is really fascinating uh i don't know if you wanted to like make any additional comments about that but maybe if you could but use that as a way to then kind of talk about how, what was their reaction when, and, and Zishan kind of alluded to it about, you know, you not becoming a doctor or an engineer, but, you know, how was it then the reaction that you wanted to pursue journalism or film respectively uh, to your father, let's say, or, or your mom who in your father's instance, certainly pursued a very non-traditional by, and by that, I mean, I'm putting it in air quotes, like Desi, you know, immigrant kind of, uh, career path. So I, I'd love for I'd love to hear that because fascinated. Absolutely, yeah, I'm, absolutely. I, so I got a quick story for you. So I was doing a show in Berlin, Germany. This was in 2012, and um, at the time there was this big. Um, uh, it was a so-called Islamophobic rally. This anti-Muslim hate group was organizing this event. And organizers were like, we should cancel this because you may be a target, it's not safe. Even the State Department had reached out saying, I don't think you should come, blah, blah, blah. Like, there's this big rally. And I'm like, whatever. Organizers worked really hard. The show is sold out. Like, we got to do this show. Um, and like many phony baloney hate groups, they said that there was going to have 100,000 people there. There might have been like 60 people that showed up to it. And thousands of Muslims, Christians... Jews, Hindus, Sikhs, atheists that form an interfaith coalition to speak out against them. So I do the show and I start telling a story about my dad. And so my dad, uh, our dad um, was a civil engineer in India and came to America. And um, like many people at the time in the 60s and 70s, his degree didn't really mean much um, at the time. And so he had to figure out other ways to make ends, ends meet. And so he started working at Dunkin Donuts. And, um, you know, life happens, family happens and became a manager of a store, decided to open up his own stores and his life, you know, took a different path. And I was telling the story about how, um, like many dads, my dad um, was just very hard on us when it came to grades. Um, if I got brought home a report card and if it was a 95 percent, he'd be like, why isn't it 100 and if I got 100%, he'd be like, why are you taking such easy classes? You just going to school to get straight A's? Like, what are you doing? Like, why aren't you pushing yourself? He was just always like that. And I'll never forget this because I remember one day 
I told my dad, I'm like, dad, nothing's ever good enough for you. Like I keep doing this. Like I keep getting these grades and you never like say it's never good enough. And I was getting so mad. And he told me this story about how um, his career choices and how he wanted to be a civil engineer, um, but life happens and obviously he doesn't regret it, but there's a part of him that still feels sad. And I'll never forget this. He told me um, every time I drive on a highway, uh, I feel sad. Uh, or I drive on a bridge or a highway, I feel sad because I think that could have been me. And the reason why I push you kids so much is I never want you to feel like that could be me. And so I'm doing this show and I, I share the story on stage. And afterwards, um, uh, some of the people that were at the rally came inside. Uh, this one guy, David, he was a skinhead and he was there at the show. And so I talked to him after and just straight up, he came up to me and he was just like, Hey, um, I, I'll admit, like, I have never met a Muslim before. Uh, I was really afraid of y'all. Didn't really know what this was all about. Uh, but there's a comedy show and people are p said to come in. So I decided to, and he's like, I, did, I feel ashamed that, you know, that I ever had thought those things. And he started talking about his dad, his dad, was a Polish immigrant that came to Germany that was pushing him in similar ways to succeed. And I'll never forget this. He goes, um, hearing the story about your dad made me makes me want to go home and give my dad a hug. And I said, the fact that you just said that makes me want to go home and give my dad a hug. And I'll never forget this, but um, I called my dad that night and I said, dad, this is the most beautiful bridge you've ever designed. This is better than any kind of architecture or anything like that. Um, and yeah, so my parents, our parents, they weren't against us. They weren't against like the arts or anything like that. It was just, they didn't really know, you know, we're first generation. And so they just didn't really know, like to say you want to be a writer or a filmmaker or anything like that. There's nobody that they can look at the time. There was nobody they could look at. So they were more like, what is your plan? How are you going to do this? How are you going to build a career out of it? And so they were asking tough questions and they pushed us, but I'm glad they did because it forced us to really think, okay, how are we going to do this? How are we going to get this off the ground? We can't just make a film for the sake of making a film. We got to make the best film that we can possibly make. We got to put our heart and soul into it. And that has just been the fire that has always uh, been lit under us is just continue to give everything our all because we know that our parents uh like many people's parents gave up their hopes and dreams so that we could chase ours and that is something that we always hold with us uh, uh yeah you know that, that that thank you for sharing such a beautiful story now I, I have to ask you know like the movie i know the documentary is dedicated in loving memory of uh uh sayed liakhat ali is is that your father he, he's he's no longer with us yeah yeah that was um yeah that was the dedication to him he passed away um during the um the filming well, and may god have mercy process. on his soul and thank you so much Aman, for sharing that and 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 you know when you mentioned the idea of of the bridge like the most beautiful bridge that he could have possibly created um you know that is such a just a just a profound tribute to your father uh but uh, uh no I, I really thank you for oh sorry go ahead zishan please Oh, no, no, that was the, this is Omar's just, just, I wanted to say, you know, um, Aman, I've, I've been, I've been, somehow I stumbled upon your, your Facebook posts. I don't know, if, you know, just over a year, somebody, somebody reposted. And to be honest, we've never met. This is the first time we're chatting. I, I don't think we even have any major common connections, but I've just always really enjoyed reading your Facebook, Facebook posts. They're, they're long. Um, mm -hmm. but I always know that if I, you know, power through them, <laughs> uh, you're going to get like a gem of, of something really interesting. And, uh, um, just, you know, even now hearing you, you definitely have a talent for telling stories, even just in that short little story you told. Um, so yeah, I just, I just want to let you know, yeah, I, I appreciate that. And, and, um, you know, I do have to, I, I had mentioned earlier, uh, before we started, I did have to drop, uh, today, uh, a little earlier, um, just do it to a, a, a commitment as the dad taking the kids swimming. Um, 
but uh, you know, I'm going to be listening to the rest of this this recording as as a as a fan now. Um, okay. Just like I, I like reading all your posts, I'm, I'm going to listen to this. And I did watch the movie. It's it's I, it's great. I recommend uh, all our listeners to check it out. Uh, it's about an hour twenty five, but it it goes by really fast. You're really going to enjoy it. Uh, it's definitely a piece of art. So um, with that said, I'm going to hand it off to Pervez and, and he's going he's gonna to take it from here. But thanks so much, guys. Uh, really uh, enjoyed connecting with you and hope to keep in touch. Uh, thank yeah. Thank no, th- so thank you, uh, both of you, for, for kind of sharing that. So I guess uh, if we could then maybe shift into a conversation around the film. Um, and uh, I, I guess for, for starters, I would love to hear from you, Aman, as the producer and Zishan as the director. Um, you know, why this particular subject matter? Why this particular location, individual? I mean, there's so much, right? So what was it about this particular story that attracted you? Uh, because it's a documentary. So, I mean, you know, we, we've talked to filmmakers in the past, but, you know, for them, it's it's like directing a movie, a, a fictional, you know, movie. So it's a very different sort of creative process. Um, but at the same time, we have talked to, like, for example, uh, Justin Mashouf, who directed uh, The Honest Struggle, which I, I imagine the two of you have seen. Um, and, you know, we, we interviewed him back in October 19. Yeah, that was that was a fast. That was, an again, an excellent documentary. Uh, and, and, and we talked to him. But, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, like I said, I'm, I'm curious as, as you two approach the, uh, the documentary or to tell the story, what, what was it about this particular story that attracted you? Yeah, I mean, there is a few different things. I mean, when we were in the process of kind of making work together at the early stages, I mean, we were really looking for stories kind of going back to like our early experiences. Like we were looking for complicated narratives in some ways because we were not seeing that in the world and especially in the documentary space. Like it was really so deeply political. Like every documentary or content documentary style content about Muslims had something to do with immigration post 9 11. Um, you know, this is around like the time of like leading up to Trump getting first elected. Like everything was just contextualized through a very political lens, which we were just kind of tired of. So we were kind of like having our like collecting stories. We were telling a couple of short films. We were kind of brainstorming and development on a couple of ideas. And we got introduced to the casket shop. Um, in Newark, we're based in New York City. So it really wasn't that far at all. So we were like, let's just go out there. Let's bring a camera. This could be an interesting short film. We really thought it was just going to be like a weekend shoot. We we're going to film at the casket shop, um, get some footage. You know, not many people know what a casket shop is like. So that was like our first thinking of this film. Um, when we got there, though, and when we met our subjects for the first time, and when we started spending time with them, it was just like, you had met like an old friend in some way. Like when we first met Hanif, like we met Hanif at a washing, actually we weren't filming. We were just there to kind of like observe and attend. Um, And Hanif, like instantly, he didn't even know who we were. He was just like in the room with us during the washing and just like formed an immediate sort of bond and connection with us. Like afterwards we got lunch and we sat down for like, like hours and just talked and talked and talked and shared our life experiences. And um, it was like, it was really like I could spend hours with this person. I could spend days with this person. And that's really what it started. It started with just like a genuine friendship between us. Um, And then we started filming a little bit and really it clicked into the idea of the movie was there's a scene in the film where one of the young men that he mentors for Kwan comes into the casket shop and Hanif teaches for Kwan how to build a casket. And I think that is exactly the moment where like, this went from just a profile piece. This went from just like a visual exercise into something that was deeply profound because as this man was tending to the dead, tending to those that have passed, as we're kind of exploring the rituals of death, these young men are coming of age in real time. And this juxtaposition of life and death was actually the most complicated, the most sort of like unexpected type of story we could have imagined. Um, And it was just happening kind of right in front of us. So that was really like, the moment where we understood that we wanted to keep filming. I mean, it took us a long time before we realized we had a Mm. film because we had never made a film before. So this was like our first go at it. So we were really just like taking a camera and filming and observing and putting footage together. And 
it wasn't when I mean, we started pitching it probably like a year or two later after like, you know, to industry side of like, that's when I think we realized when people saw the footage, they're like, wait, no, you definitely have something here. This is super interesting. And that's where we just kept going. We started building momentum. And I mean, it's an outstanding history. film. And I just say, I, and I don't just say that because I have you two, you know, as guests, I, I sincerely mean that. Um, and, and, and when you say it's your sort of maiden project or voyage into filmmaking, it is, it, it makes it all the more outstanding. Um, I, I want to make a quick note here, just sort of an edu- perhaps an editorial note for our listeners, is uh, even though this isn't sort of a, you know, Hollywood blockbuster movie or something, we are going to get into quote unquote spoilers. Uh, so if you haven't watched the film, I would highly recommend you watch the movie before you listen to the rest of the episode, because we are going to get into certain narrative choices and, and, and things that happen in the journey or in the life of these characters um, that the film follows, um, that would be certainly spoilers. And so just fair warning. Um, and, and as I say that, I would, I would love for you two to sort of chime in and, and just remind our listeners where they can watch the film. I know at present it has, it's in limited theatrical release. I mean, then again, all movies are limited theatrical release post pandemic, but, um, yeah, if you don't mind just sharing that. And then, like I said, for those listeners, who want to check out the film and then come back to the episode, they can do so. Oh. Yeah, so it's available in theaters nationwide uh, uh, on twogodsfilm.com. Uh, and you can find out where the showtimes are. The cool thing is with the pandemic, because of COVID and uh, a lot of cinemas are showing the films virtually, and you can access it anywhere in the U.S. So a theater in Berkeley, you can watch it from Florida and vice versa. And so it's available for people to watch. And then PBS... Uh, we'll be airing the film uh, nationwide as well on uh, June 21st. Thank you for that. So um, multiple ways you can catch. Yeah. It. So I, again, I have so many questions. Uh, Aman, I, I don't know if you wanted to like add your thoughts about the the like the project or the thematic material, uh, like Zishan did. Yeah. No, I think Zishan definitely nailed it. Uh, and I think for me, um, you know, before uh, we did this film. Um, project that we did was the 30 mosques in 30 days project where uh my friend basam tark and i and zishan uh, helped along as well um we went to every state in america to tell stories about muslim american communities and from that i think um what people wanted to see is they just wanted to see nuanced stories about muslims they wanted to see actual muslim stories that looked like them that felt like them you know the the idea of like oh that's me up there or like hey i don't know that person but i feel like i know that person or that feels like me that feels like something i would say that feels like a guy i know at the mosque um that really wasn't happening on in cinema and in tv at the time and so that was always our lens and that's always been our lens is making sure uh that you know people feel seen because we were those kids that didn't feel like we were being seen so it was very important for us to make sure in telling this story that not only the people in our film, but people in similar communities. Yeah. I mean, but, but well. with regards to that kind of like, uh, you know, what's the word, like sort of the Genesis or um, what led you to wanting to, you know, tell a story, you could have gone even a fictional route. So, I mean, what I'm wondering is like for you, like, in, like specifically I'm on, what was it about the documentary approach that resonated as opposed to, you know, coming up with like a fictional narrative? I think just ordinary, no, that's a great question. I think just ordinary life is so interesting to me. Uh, And I use ordinary in in quotes, uh, but it's just, I've just always been fascinated with talking to people and hearing about people um, that I don't, it's just how my brain works is. I just love, maybe it's the traditional journalist in me, but I just love, capturing people's stories and sharing it with others that I don't need to sit there and create again, not to dismiss it. I think creative work is incredible. Um, but for me, I've just always been attracted to hearing people's stories from all over the world. And yeah. And so naturally because of the path I was already on and as a kid explaining my story professionally writing stories. And then as a performer, 
capturing those stories and telling those stories. It was just very natural. Yeah, you know, it's uh, funny that like the videos I have seen of you, uh, Aman, it, a lot of it is just you telling stories that have happened to you, whether it's the, uh, like, or, you know, getting the Muslim meal on an airplane, yeah. or I remember just you turning your camera on when you showed up at your mom's house with your, or no, sorry, your mom shows up when you've shaved your beard and, and her elation and excitement at that fact. And I could totally relate to that. Uh, as I've grown my little pandemic beard here, uh, this is a lot bushier and hairier than I'm used to. Uh, I'm just waiting for the shock when my mother sees me in about a week because uh, I'm going to see her. And so <laughs> you're not going to get that as well. So what? <laughs> you should. Yeah, capture that. It's a great, it's a great video. That. I watch that video, video. all the time. Uh, or are you telling uh, your story about uh, dancing to Tupac videos? Um <laughs> so yeah, I can I can certainly see the approach of wanting to, uh, you know, uh, like sort of a slice of life, you know, uh, and and kind of capture the comedic and the dramatic moments therein. Um, so yeah, anyway, getting into the film directly. I mean, again, there's so much that I want to ask you, Zishan, as as kind of the person capturing these images because the images are moving and uh, you have a real eye for imagery and. Uh, and, and so, like, I, I want to almost save that for, like, uh, towards or, like, a, a, you know, a later part of the conversation. But I'd love to kind of get into the actual individuals we see, right, and we meet. And so certainly there's Hanif, who's, you know, probably the the primary protagonist. And, and like you said, uh, Zishan uh, and, and Aman both, uh, like, you know, he's this, uh, he's a casket maker, but he also performs the ghusl or the uh, uh, ritual purification washing that occurs prior to burial uh, upon death. Um, and, and, and then, you know, kind of his, his own kind of unique journey uh, and how he's mentoring these children, these, these young adults, uh, or in the case of Forquan, like a young boy. And at the same time, he's a father. He, he also has a real son, Tyler, right, who he's reconnecting with because he has spent a, a, a certain amount of his time incarcerated. Uh, and I mean by him, I mean Hanif. So um, I, I guess, you know, wow. So like I remember one of the early scenes that really struck me is – like the way Hanif is introduced, you know, he, he, he like gets a call about a, about a person who's passed away and how they need, you know, funeral arrangements to be made immediately. And that's sort of our introduction to Hanif. But to me, the real kind of introduction to Hanif comes a, a, a few scenes later, one where he's preparing or making these caskets and he's got like hip hop music blaring. And I just found that sort of contradiction there or the, or the imagery being so jarring because he's, doing this task that is associated with death, that is generally macabre and, you know, all of that somber to say the least, but he's like jamming a hip hop. Right. So I just found that imagery so fascinating. I wonder if that was like, you know, while you were filming it, I mean, was it like, Oh, I got to get this on camera because it is so fascinating or was it something else? I mean, yeah. If you don't mind sharing that. Yeah, I mean, the amount of footage that we have of Hanif yeah. dancing um, to music is, I, we could probably make a two hour documentary of just that. I mean, it was like, that was, that was really like, um, yeah. so true to himself. Like every time you walk by the casket shop and Hanif was building a casket, music would be blaring, the door would be open. It was never like a closed space. It was like, come in, hang out, listen to music, um, you know. It was kind of sometimes a nightmare to film because we'd be like trying to have a conversation and we'd be like, we don't have the rights to this song. Can you like turn down the music? And every time he would turn down, we would turn down the music. He would just, he would be like, this doesn't feel right. Like he's like, I got to have something on. Like the TV has to be on the background. There was always something. So it was really important that like from a, just an environmental standpoint of like the scene, like that casket shop is never quiet. Like that, it was always, it always had music and Honey was always dancing I think editorially, we thought it was going to be, you know, in our conversations in the edit room and then working with our editor, um, you know, we thought it would be really sort of like great to kind of lead you into the film. Not that at the beginning of the film is expected, like there's unexpected elements, but it's like you, you think you're getting a film about casket making and washings and the film opens in that way. Like it opens rising to action. You see a washing, you hear the adhan, you see the sort of like grandness right and like the film kind of crescendos and then right after the title it almost like 
directly cuts to Hanif dancing in a casket shop. And like from there, it cuts to Fraquan lighting a birthday candle in his house. And it's like really like that's like kind of pulling the rug out from the audience. It's like you think you're getting a film about this, but what you're actually getting is a film about joy and, uh, you know, identity and like a young boy celebrating his birthday. Like that's really what it is because in the same way that life is not about our careers or about what we do or how we perform a ritual or how we kind of show ourselves to the outside world. It's who we are behind closed doors, which is often silly and joyful and kind of like unfiltered. And we really wanted that to kind of shine through. Um, And so that was really like a kind of an edit trick that we did, but it was actually very important because that was what we happened with us. Like the first time Honey put a dancing building a casket, we were like, right. what are you doing? Like, this is amazing. Like, this is so cool. Um, so yeah, I think it was just very natural to kind and of like, he's Hanif such an really authentic character. I mean, I, I, obviously he's a real person. So, but, so he's not, a, he's not an authentic character. He just keeps it real 100% of the time, you know, whether it's, you know, uh, you know, uh, vernacular profanity, whatever may be the case, you know, he's very unfiltered, very authentic in terms of like, you could tell he's not even putting on a persona or shying away from anything just because a camera is on him. Like he keeps it real throughout the film. Um, and I loved what you said about, uh, pulling the, you know, pulling the rug from beneath the audience, because I felt that so many times, Um, like for me, it was about maybe 20 minutes to 30 minutes into the movie. I thought I had it figured out like, oh, so this is going to be a redemption story. This is going to be the story of Hanif and how he finds absolution or redemption for the, for the past life that he's lived. And guess what? And this is what I meant by spoilers. It's not that story, right? He, 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 he slips and he falters throughout, you know, in the story itself. So it's not even that. And so there's so many times where, like you said, you know, and that's life. I mean, life is not going to be a neatly packaged Hollywood uh, screenplay. It's going to be complicated and it's going to ebb and flow and have ups and downs. And, and I think you just beautifully, you know, again, you know, shined a, a, a like a like a, a lens to it. Um, what I was going to also say was like the second time we're quote unquote introduced to Hanif is when we meet Janice, his niece, right? And she tells the story about Hanif's kind of quote unquote troubled past and being incarcerated and so on, because nothing is mentioned and we don't know that and we don't make well, we shouldn't make that assumption when we first meet him. It's only later that Janice talks about his background that we realize, oh, okay, so you know Hanif's got sort of a troubled past. And of course, that does come back to haunt him later on. Um, but um, you know, it's, and you you mentioned Forquan. Now he's a fascinating character, and and even though, like in in some ways, he's like your sort of secondary or second prime, you know, protagonist. Um, how, like he just walks into the into the uh, into the shop while you're filming. Is that how you're introduced to Forquan? That's exactly how we met him is he stumbled into the shop at that scene where he just stumbles in there. Wow. And he's like, Hey, what are you doing? And he's such um, a, the first time like, we met him. he's such a and vibrant young just, boy he, and he's full of energy. And yet at the same time, uh, because of what he's dealing with at home, he's so uh, raw and vulnerable as well. Like, it, wow. Talking about, you know, like a gift just sort of dropping in your lap in terms of while you're filming the story. Absolutely. Yeah. Literally within seconds of meeting him, light bulb just went on. Are, and said, are, are you it, comfortable it, talking about like, I, like cause, cause um, again, it's not, you know, it doesn't play the same narrative choices as you would in like sort of a traditional storytelling model. And so we don't know about his background. We don't know like for Quan. I mean, I'm, I'm assuming that's sort of a derivation of for Quan. He comes from a Muslim background. Uh, he's got maybe a Muslim father who is the, it was an absent father figure. Is that, is that the story? Um, to be honest, okay. he's a mixture medley of a lot of things and we don't actually know ourselves and it's not something we were very conscious in, in telling this story. We were very conscious of wanting to see people in our film the way they see themselves. And so, and I'm glad you mentioned it before, uh, even with Hanif, um, Hanif doesn't shy away from who he is. Um, but we don't look at him as a guy that was locked up in the past, right? It's not something that defines him. Similarly with Farquan, yes, there's some natural curiosity, like, hey, so what's going on? Where are you from? And this and that, like, 
it's just not something that he himself really sees himself as. And those are things that it's not that we just sweep those under the rug and ignore those. It's just, those aren't things that define people in wanting to tell their story. And those weren't, those are reasons why we didn't delve into those in the film, not because we didn't want to or anything like that. It was just, they don't see themselves that way. And so with Fraquan, for example, um, we actually don't really know his in- complete ethnic background or this, like, he's Christian as well. Um, but, and, um, mm, mm, fascinating. So yeah, it, it just uh, never really came up. Like, like Zishan, did you want to add anything to that? Yeah. I mean, I think it was, um, it was how we kind of interact in the filming, but it was actually like double important when we were editing the film in that specific way as well. Like, you never learn anything about the subjects um, unless they're presenting it to you in some way. So like you don't really know much about Fraquan's home life until like much later in the film when like he is reckoning with it himself. Like you don't know about Hanif's past until his niece is having a conversation and she mentions it. And then like, it was always kind of important because that is how it is on every, in everyday life. Like people aren't necessarily like always talking about, their difficulties they're not afraid to talk about it if it's like something right in front of them and like conversationally it comes up like Hanif will tell you all the details of his life um in a very beautifully candid way like that was like he taught me about how to be more unfiltered and sort of like myself like I'm a very guarded person and I think he's somebody that's always like don't don't have the wall up like always open yourself up because that's what's going to invite people to you um and you know but it was never like we need to kind of project the identities of like how, what their paths are um, into how we introduce them or introduce anything. Like even, you know, it didn't make sense to mention that Hanif had a son until Hanif was with his son and his son introduced the relationship that they had themselves. So it was always like giving our characters as much agency as possible and allowing them to define themselves how they wanted, because that's how they did it with us in the filming process. Like we never really like, pride any information it was like if it comes up it comes up like if they bring it up they bring it up and then maybe we'll ask a question to kind of follow up but we never really were there to like get information from them we were there to just like highlight what was happening in real time so the film we wanted it to feel like that we wanted a film to sort of like feel like it was moving in real time you're learning as the film is kind of continuing um some people find that like you know sometimes we get that feedback where they're like oh, like your film doesn't have, you know, as much backstory or doesn't have as much sort of information at this moment or I wish I knew what was happening between this scene and that scene. And we're kind of like, well, uh, you know what you see right in front of you. And the same way that like with a friend, you only know what you're there to witness. Like, and you there's moments of confession and there's moments of sort of like, like intimate sort of bonding and we capture that. But really it's just like, uh, that's not what we're here to do. We're here to just like, have their lives, this chapter of their lives documented in this very kind of specific way. Yeah. And, and I will say the other thing I would add to that is, uh, and this comes up a lot, especially uh, in communities of color. And so Newark, New Jersey is about 20, 30 minutes outside New York City. And there's a lot of just awful racist stereotypes that people have about Newark, New Jersey, that there's crime, there's lawlessness, blah, 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 gang violence, this and that. But our prism into the community was, well, there's a reason why people live here. There's a reason why there is pride and joy that people have living in Newark, New Jersey. If it was so bad and so awful, people would just get up and leave. But people are proud to be from Newark. And so it's very important for us to have a similar lens is let's see people the way they see themselves. Uh, And as Zishan said, is we wanted them to lead us down these paths instead of just projecting our opinions about this or per- just perceiving. Cause I think very often we all even consciously or subconsciously automatically just try to label people and say, Oh, well he's doing it because of this, or this is happening because they're in this circumstance because of this upbringing, because of this, because of that, because of that. And that really doesn't give people an option to share their own story, to give them nuance. And so it was very important for us to break free from that and, and letting people Lead, following their lead. Yeah, uh, I mean, it, it, it is so organic the way we're introduced to characters, whether it's Furquan uh, or later, as you said, we meet uh, his son. 
uh, not Tyler. Uh, I said his name earlier. Sorry. Uh, 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 Tyler, that's right. Trey was, yeah, uh, Trey was, Tyler, I think, Tyler, yeah. brother, younger brother, right? Yeah. yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, we meet Tyler and then we also meet Nas or Nazir, uh, as we find out later his name is, uh, because we were initially introduced to him as Nas. And uh, so Nas certainly plays a very key, uh, char- you know, he's a very key and central character as well. So again, we meet these characters just because they're coming, you know, they come into contact with Hanif. Um, and we're not, quote unquote, introduced to them the way you would normally introduce a character that's going to play a rather substantial, you know, a, a substantive or a, you know, central role in a movie or or a, even in a documentary. So I, I really appreciated that because then you were allowed to find out more about them the way probably you did as you were filming. Right. So like you said, whether it was, you know, the way we're introduced to Tyler and then we kind of find out about their kind of backstory, as it were, with regards to, you know, how they've tried to reconnect after Hanif's incarceration and so on. So, yeah, I mean, I I found I found all of that fascinating. Um, I want to kind of maybe shift into kind of a conversation now about kind of the arcs in the story or in the, in, in the documentary, excuse me, and kind of the, uh, the, 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 the sort of thematic things that you're exploring. Um, and I think in order to do that, if you don't mind, if you don't mind indulging me here, I'm going to quote something Hanif says, and I found it such a telling part of the story that I literally wrote it down word for word. Um, you know, it, it comes almost smack dab in the middle of the movie, like right around the 30 minute mark, maybe right before. So not necessarily right in the middle, but he says, I'm struggling, man. This is Hanif talking. I'm struggling, man, to make it to where I got to make it and to get to where I want to go. How I'm going to get there is to keep my head up, uh, keeping the focus how I'm going to get there to try to save a life. And to me that, first of all, like there's, it's just a beautifully way. It's just beautiful the way you capture it. um, Because there's a moment where you, you, there's like a copy, there's like a Mus'haf, like like a Quran on the, on, 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 like on, on the, on the trunk of a car or something. And you, you you know, for a second we see that. And then Hanif says this line. uh, And to me that, what he's sharing is 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 so demonstrative of what the movie is all about. I mean, would you? Am I reading all of that correctly, or would you maybe comment on 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 that particular part of it? Absolutely. I mean, and it's kind of like going back to the sort of you you mentioned it. You know, like you think you're going into this film where you're thinking about like this is a man who is just mentoring these two young boys and he's going to try to save these young men. Um, But really that line holds so much vulnerability and so much power because it's like, he's reaffirming what he thinks is his purpose is, but he's also kind of directly implying that to get by, to kind of like save himself, he needs to save these other people, right? Like his identity is so intrinsically defined by the ability to provide for somebody else. Right. Like, so that like, that's foreshadowing. We kind of put that line there that actually is like kind of the, around the, we call it Thank like the, the turning point or like the things where like things get sort of more challenging for all of our subjects. And it, it directly mirrors the moment where Hanif's actual rock bottom is the moment where he realizes that the two young men that he was trying to save are no longer in his grasp. Like that is like the, the sort of like the, the, and then his sort of coming up from that is sort of like, his ability to understand that just because they're not right in front of him directly, there's ways that he can still have an impact. There's ways his story can live on. There's ways his legacy can live on. So it's like, that was really, um, I'm glad you picked up on that because that line was very much, we were trying to make it sort of like foreshadowing, but also just kind of like a moment of Hanif isn't preaching really. He's not, that was like, that was genuine from the heart. He was just walking down the street and he was genuinely like, I need to, how am I going to get by? By like trying to keep my head up, but also like, how am I going to get by? Like by trying to yeah. save a and life, it, which it, yeah, that was, yeah, I, I thought thank was you so for that. I'm on. I'll, I'll, I'd love to hear your thoughts in a second too. But I, you know, I just want to say like, even you know, beyond the line, it's the visual storytelling as well because he's walking in this street in Newark as he's saying that because a part of the movie and you and you mentioned this, uh, uh, Zishan, is the the documentary is taking place. You're following these characters 
But at the backdrop of all of that is, uh, is, is these kids that are being gunned down in the streets that are essentially being raised by whatever circumstances they come across in the streets, whether it's Nas, whether it's for Quan. And so for Hanif to say that, because what he's offering or what he hopes, I think, to offer these kids is really kind of, again, be that mentor so that they don't. So they aren't, quote unquote, raised by the streets and fall into the same circumstances that he did. Um, and, and yeah, so just even visually, that it's such a telling part of the story. Um, Aman, if you had any thoughts, I'd, I'd love to hear it as well. Yeah, no, uh, absolutely. And um, one of the things we really like uh, in, in making this film is we wanted to make things um, as open as possible as far as how people perceive and interpret things, because based on who you are, based on your upbringing, your experiences, your exposure, where you've traveled, people are going to, ref and what you've encountered in life, people are gonna reflect on things in different ways. And so, no, so I wanna definitely honor and, uh, and appreciate what you just said. And to, to what you're talking about with the conflict, it really even, so people ask us like, what, where did the title of the film uh, come from? It's not, And yeah. it came from, um, it's not in the film, but a, uh, one of the, one of the um, funeral directors in the film talked about how a lot of kids, uh, and younger generations of people, uh, are trying to worship two gods. And I said, what do you mean by that? He's like, well, mm. there's Allah, there's God, and then there's the dunya. Uh, and people are trying to worship both at the same time. And that's a central conflict of faith is how are you trying to think about tomorrow when all you can think about is getting by through today, right? And so how are people in this community – communities all over the world, how can they think about their future? How can they think about the afterlife when they're just trying to figure out how can I make the next buck? How can I do this? How can I get through my day? And trying to worship people trying to worship two gods at the same time is that central conflict of faith that each and every one of us experiences. That, that, that is beautiful. And, and, and yeah, I was going to ask you actually about the title a little later, but yeah, no, I really appreciate that. Um, you know, I was kind of waiting for that in the movie. And then I said, hmm, you know, and it's not there deliberately, I would think, because, again, you're asked to explore like the, the like what the title means in the context of what you've just watched. So and I certainly did that and I wrestled with that. And, and, and one of the things I did fall on was certainly what you just mentioned, Amon, which is this conflict between, you know, like, you know, dunya and, and Allah and dunya and God, like your worldly pursuits and your and your commitment and devotion to God. But, but there's also so many others, right? There's also the uh, idol, if you will, of one's own ego and one's own like nafs, right? One's own struggles with trying to contain, you know, elements of one's past or one's passions or one's desires. And we see that not only with Hanif and what happens to him in the movie, but with Nas as well, right? Because Nas is trying to do the right thing. He values what the role that Hanif plays in his life, but... Unfortunately, you know, he falls victim uh, of circumstance as well. And he's picked up and he's arrested on far more severe charges than Hanif is. But, you know, again, there's that struggle, right? The struggle between trying to do the right thing and succumbing to one, you know, not, not only maybe to one's own darker aspects, but certainly or succumbing to the streets or succumbing to environment, whatever that may be the case. There's a, so there's always a struggle between two gods. Absolutely. And, and that's why we wanted to capture that in this film, because I think very often when it comes to portrayals about Islam uh, in film and in TV, it's very much of a dogmatic, right. I don't eat pork, I don't drink, and I pray. And that's it. There's really no space to really celebrate the heart of our faith with their very rich, complicated, layered, nuanced discussions about spirituality. And that's why in the film, we don't really explain a lot. We don't really... I mean, we give you bits and pieces of the Janazah process, but this isn't a 101 on Islam because we wanted people to feel as immersed as possible. Because I felt, I feel like if we just go around just explaining every little thing yeah. we believe, it kind of others people and it doesn't really include them into these spaces. And so we wanted people to feel like they're sitting next to Hanif and sitting next to Nas and grappling with these absolutely, same decisions. Absolutely, absolutely. And, and, uh, and you know, I, I think it also well. speaks to what I hope is there is a maturation in the Muslim palette. And by that, I mean, you know, for, for, for the arts, for movies like this. And what I mean by that is you're so right in saying that 
while Muslims for years talked about the characters that were portrayed in media, negatively speaking about Muslims. But now when we see like almost cookie cutter kind of like, you know, everything's perfect, the perfect Muslim kind of trope, you know, I almost have the same kind of visceral reaction to that because that's not real either. As much as, you know, a terrorist on, you know, on uh, in, in Delta Force isn't real. To me, the sort of perfect angelic Muslim isn't real either. And so for me to have to grapple with real life characters is, is the way life is. And I think, I, and I would say, unfortunately, and, and the reason I mentioned about the idea of the maturation of the Muslim palette is this, because we have seen elements of that. And I'll call attention to, for example, I haven't seen it and Omar dropped off, but you know, he recommended it to me. I just didn't get around to seeing it, but there was like two, I think two seasons of the show Rami, right? And, 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 and there you see a yep. flawed character. You see a Muslim who is struggling with his faith, who's struggling with the decisions he makes um, and, and how in harmony or in, or in congruence they are with his religious teachings. Um, perhaps another individual that comes to mind is someone like Hassan Minhaj, you know, who has a show or did have a show and, you know, uses certain vernacular and profanity and so on. And, and, and you know, again, I, what I've seen among Muslims all too often is a rejection of that because it's just too authentic, too real, or that, oh, we're supposed to like, oh, like Rami, Rami Yusuf is supposed to be this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, role model for my youth. And I'm like, no, he never says he's a role model. I mean, that's the whole point of the show. Like, you know what I mean? If your children are looking for role models in Rami, they're looking in the wrong places. Like, so, let, and that's what I mean by the maturation of the Muslim palette. I think, I, I hope that, you know, a, a movie like this allows um, that palette to develop where we can really wrestle with seeing imagery and with Muslims on screen that are less than perfect. Uh, absolutely, uh, absolutely. And I think that is something that it's, it's well intended, um, but this idea of just the only stories yeah. that we celebrate are these people of perfection and this and that. Exactly. Um, it, it, it's very hard to live up to that. And it's very hard to really feel any kind of connection. Exactly. Even the way we talk about our beloved prophets, our prophets are incredible people. They made mistakes. They had doubt. They had, they went through challenges. They were human beings. They went through tough times. Some of them had tempers. Some of them had attitudes and this and that. And so it's important to capture people's humanity. For us, it wasn't about um, trying to just project something, trying to change people's perceptions. We just wanted just to capture life, capture humanity the way we live it. And yeah, Zishan, we, we haven't heard from you. I, I, I want to make sure, uh, like, a, anything that you want to add to that, I mean, I'd love to hear it before we kind of move into, like, where I want to take the conversation next. Yeah, I mean, I think, like, on a personal level, I think that, you know, the reason why, you know, two gods, you know, Amon set up the sort of like juxtaposition of two gods, like that was the kind of where it came from. But the sort of like the holding of that concept is actually like, like religion is never practiced in a vacuum. Like it's never practiced in a bubble. Um, the thing that is the most challenging thing about faith is showing up and making that choice to like reaffirm anything in your life on a daily basis. And that is to be like, vulnerable that's to be human like it really is like um that to me feels like the universality of like our experiences as muslims no matter what we come from there's going to be things that are going to test our patience they're going to test our strength going to test our spirituality and i actually think like growing up like i struggled more i mean yeah it was like films that had negative images of muslims like you said harmful maybe but i actually felt it more harmful when i would like walk out of a khutbah and like the imam was like isn't it so easy to like fast and like don't do anything right. bad and like you're never going to talk to like these kids at school and you're just going to like do and i was like what are you talking about like th that is not that is not i walk out of the masjid and i go and like i have to deal with the world in front of me like i have to deal with temptation i have to deal with struggle i have to deal with my own version of survival i have to reckon with you know, my mental health, like all of these things that I think now as a Muslim community, we're reckoning with and recorded, like the appetite is growing. But I think what we realize is like, the bad Muslim narrative, quote, unquote, that like, 
we were trying to reject is actually like the Muslim the Muslim narrative. Like the Muslim narrative is like we're all we're all bad, we're all complicated, we're all messy, we're all imperfect. Like that is thing the thing that unites us. And I think your what you said I really resonated with. Like I also have a very visceral response anytime I see something that is like a good Muslim or like when a film just shows a Muslim praying and like that's it. Um, because it's like uh, you know, like that's not all that we do. And if anything, like, like I struggle to pray all the time too. Like, it's just like, that's not my identity. My identity is really about like who I am as a human being existing in the world today. And I think that's why this film felt so sort of important to hold the messiness, the untidiness of the storytelling, because, um, it, that that's, that's real. Like that's more interesting. I mean, that's, exactly. person, like, that's just more, sorry. I, I'm on that. Yeah. Go ahead. Film. Yeah. yeah I'm, I- I'm telling, I'm telling mommy you're not praying. So, <laughs> go ahead. Yeah, she she calls me every day and reminds me to do my do my isha and do my fajr. The isha before That's bed and wake awesome. up. Awesome. I've got an eight year old daughter my, my and a twelve year old. So, uh, I guess that never ends, huh? Reminding your kids to pray. <laughs> thanks for the thanks for foreshadowing what my life's exactly. Thanks for telling yeah, me what you have a lifetime to look forward to. Uh, yeah. 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 <laughs> No, I just wanted to make a comment about this whole exactly. good Muslim idea because that has become such a trope in Hollywood. And and what's interesting is like even that trope of the quote unquote good Muslim that we often see is what? It's still within the apparatus of like national security or something because the good Muslim is the one who cooperates with authorities. The good Muslim is the one who, you know, you know, calls the authorities when he hears a bad khutbah, right? Or or cooperates with the national security apparatus. So again, you know, this is the dangers of caricatures of any kind, whether it's the bad Muslim trope, the terrorist, or it's the good Muslim trope, the guy who works with, you know, national security, you know, uh, forces to defeat evil and defeat Al Qaeda. Right. So it's, it's all there. So I, I really appreciate that. That's neither here, here nor there because that's not what we're talking about. But, um, I, I want to Zishan for the sake of time as well, um, kind of delve into, uh, the, the movie visually like I, and we'll come back to some of the thematic stuff as well but because you've talked about juxtaposition or that's certainly a word that has been mentioned a few times on the show uh, on the on the on the show the movie is replete with juxtapositions and and i think for starters there's the two gods that's a juxta a juxtaposition there's the movie is black and white Right. If that's the juxtaposition, right? it's black and white. It's very stark. Um, and, and I'm going to ask you to comment on all these things, but I just want to sort of unpack a few things. Uh, and then there's also the, the juxtaposition that I found between what we see time and time again throughout intervals in the movie is either a birthday celebration or a burial taking place. And that can't just be right accidental. I mean, to me, there's a very deliberate way you film that. And um, I found that so profound and so deep because that is life, right? I mean, certainly. Oh, and then there's the, it's not so much a a juxtaposition as much as the fact that the movie is bookended with to God we belong and to him is our return. And then in the end, we have the transliteration of that in the Arabic, inna lillahi wa inna ilayhi rajiun, right? So that also bookends the movies, uh, I'm sorry, the film. So talk about that for both, both of you. I mean, I'd love to hear your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I appreciate you kind of like summing that up in a nice way because it really is like so many of those okay. choices, I think were like completely sort of intentional. That juxtaposition was so, so important. Like, you know, the decision to do black and white, I think, um kind of like that came from more of like the desire of like we wanted a film that did set up that sort of juxtaposition but it also like we wanted a film that felt deeply sort of intimate and like the film to me is also like holding two spaces it's holding these sort of like rituals of death and the sort of like the the spirituality and the sort of like beauty of those moments um but it's also holding like these coming of age moments of the young men just kind of like growing up for the first time and like those are just as intimate and those are just as sort of like, like spiritual, like we hold equal reverence for a janazah as we do to like 
a young boy blowing out a birthday candle because both of those are defining moments in all of our lives. Like both of those are the things that we understand God and we understand life and we understand everything in between. And so that was like kind of like the black and white was a very sort of like simple, but very sort of powerful visual tool that I think was allowing us to make that statement of like, hold all of these images with equal love and care and sort of like reverence, like nothing and nothing weighs more than the other here. Like it's all kind of like existing with the same level of care um, and intimacy. Like we wanted everything to feel sort of intimate, but I think there was so many sort of like other editorial juxtapositions that we wanted to do where it was exactly that. Like, you know, we would sometimes go directly from Hanif building a casket where there's a shot of like Hanif literally hand kind of running along a casket and then it goes to Fraquan lighting a birthday candle. And we're kind of like directly juxtaposing these sort of images, these sort of moments in time um, of like joy and sadness, of grief and celebration. Because to me, that is sort of like exactly what life is like. Like you, you know, when you celebrate a birthday, you're happy, but you could also be navigating grief. You could also be navigating loss. Um, you're holding both of those things with equal sort of weight. And I think that was a sort of like really sort of important. And I think like how we then framed the film beginning to end. I mean, the film opens with the sort of like English translation of, you know, in a, in a, in a region, but also like it, the film opens with a washing um, of like honey, like water, um, but then also like Hanif performing a washing um, to show like Hanif giving care to sort of like somebody else, like giving care in this ritual. And the film actually ends with Hanif performing wudu and like looking in the mirror and washing himself. Like, so he's, he's, he's like kind of completing this sort of like juxtaposition of ritual where it's like the, the washing is something that is provided for somebody else. But this ritual that we do as Muslims five times a day before we pray, which is to wash ourselves and prepare ourselves in an equal act of care and an equal act of love. It's like, that all of those sort of juxtapositions were really sort of important to frame the film as, um, you know, this it's it's life and death, it's joy and sadness, it's um, you know, it's saying goodbye and, uh, and you know saying hello to somebody that's going to like you know change your life, you know, whether you are aware of it or not. Like all of those things are so interconnected, and so all of those sort of visual stylistic choices were ways that we were constantly reaffirming. Um, that, you know, sort like, of I, I couldn't help as you were talking, like it, it dawned on me as it were. And, and, and this again speaks to what a, what a good movie can do, which is, you know, you, you, you think of these things even, you know, hours or days after watching it, which is Hanif is like this, he's, he's this, he's this figure of transition, right? Because he's, he's helping these, he's transitioning these bodies because you know, one of the things of Wusel is to transition the body from this life into the next, right? From this life into the grave. And so, you know, he's, tra- he's, he's, he's providing care or providing that service of transition of these bodies. But at the same time, he, uh, or, or let me also say, but where those bodies came from and where those, where those spirits may end up, like in terms of our own eschatology, like, where those rest, where the final final resting place is, only God knows. And it's similar to the the, the function that he has in the lives of people like Nas and Forquan, in that he is but one stop or one figure in this transitory journey of theirs. And you know where they come from and where they will end up. I mean, Hanif plays a part, but he by no means can dictate or necessarily control as he is with that body where it's going he's just providing a service Uh, absolutely and that's why um one of my favorite quotes uh, in the film was towards the end when hanif talks about how when he was locked up he used to watch um leaves falling out of trees squirrels would gather nuts and drop them and the observation in conclusion came to is everything has life and that's why throughout the film if you've noticed that like it starts off things are a little shriveled and then leaves block or th- leaves start falling and then they start growing again and it rains and it just shows the cyclical nature of life that we go through hardships you know those those nuts fall but we persevere and and we push through and it's funny because when we were filming we would film like hours and hours 
and I'd be so tired. I want to go home. And Zishan would be like, let me film this puddle. Or <laughs> let me film uh, by that these point. flowers. And I'm like, why? I'm like, I'm like I want to go home. And he was just like, stop. I need to get this. And then when I saw like the first cut, and, you know, there's him as editor. Right. Cut, I'm like, oh, snap. <laughs> That's what you do with it. That's the and hence, I'm okay. the producer and you're the director, okay. right? So, <laughs> exactly. Oh, wow. Uh, uh, I got to ask because I mean, this I dynamic's got to play out. Um, who's the older brother here? Uh, who said I am? Sorry. I am. <laughs> For the I record, am Amon, you got to own it, I brother. I am. You got to own it. And I say that, by the way, yeah. uh, going back to like. Uh, Put it that way. I think we talked about beards already, but I, I'm admiring your sort of thick, bushy, black beard. The, the the thing that I once had on my face and I no longer have. So so kudos. And then at the same time, the thick locks of hair that Zishan has that both of us, Aman, you and I envy. <laughs> <laughs> uh, anyway, sorry for the little yeah. comedic uh, interlude there. Um, yeah, there's just so much. Um, uh, we, we, one of the things you both mentioned like, and I'm so glad you called attention to it, Aman, which is this idea of life and rebirth and rejuvenation, because there's also the passage of time throughout the film, right? It's 126 minutes, but how much time actually passes in the lives of these individuals, we don't know. And the reason I suspect that it's more than like a month, like, because like Ramadan, by the way, it almost seems like the movie is happening at the backdrop of like Ramadan because they're always going to like Tarawi prayers and so on, or you're going to the mosque and there's like a prayer and you just, and they mention Ramadan. So you're thinking, okay, you know, this is like, you know, in the month of Ramadan, but that can't possibly be true because of the way we see for Quan more, most notably age. Like by the beginning, in the beginning of the movie, he's like this, you know, he's this little kid. And by the end of it, he's like this teenager, his voice is even changing. So Without maybe giving away too much, like, was that also deliberate? And I would love, like, well, I don't know how you do this without giving it away, but am I right in this, in assessing that there's a pretty, th there's more of a substantial amount of time that has passed than, than what we maybe see in the documentary? Yeah, I mean. Oh, wow. I mean, the see, film was never, filmed the Okay, of wow, that's amazing. Okay. Um, so. But I think it was, to your point, like it was very important yes. that this film felt sort of like timeless in this sort of way, like it, you're kind of suspended in time. And actually, like, it was very intentional that like the first half of the film feels very like it could be in the span of a week, maybe like it just it feels very sort of like you wake up, you're with this subject, and then they go to bed, and then you're with this other subject. It feels very sort of like matter of fact, and super, super intimate. But then what actually happens is like, without giving anything away, there's, there's that, that turning point in the film where all of our subjects encounter something like very difficult, um, grief of some sort, right? Like it's some compounded grief or some compounded loss. Exactly. And then suddenly time starts to get a little looser. Um, and it's interesting because sometimes when people watch the film, they'll be like, whoa, like I feel like the second half of your film, like things are sort of like, moving a little faster like time's moving quicker and it's like that is exactly what the process of grief feels like like when you lose somebody when you navigate grief like in the moment it might feel like every day is like you know 40 hours but then suddenly you let go of time and like weeks are going by and months are going by and somebody's reminding you like oh it's been a year since this person passed or it's been you know six months and that's when like things become more fluid and like things become sort of more complicated. And that was where we sort of started to mix the worlds of the film and we mixed the tones of the film and we sort of kind of like started to swim in time a little bit more. And then when you see Fraquan as just like a 16 year old kid and his voice is deeper, I think that's when everyone who sees the film, they're just kind of like, what happened? Like he's suddenly like a young man instead of a kid. And it's kind of like, that's what, that's how life is. Like, you know, life passes you by before you know it. And we wanted the film to sort of feel like both intimate and yeah, grand you know, at the uh, same time. And I, I, definitely time just to let us. our listeners know, I mean, this whole interview sort of came to be because uh, former co-host of the show, Zaki Hassan, kind of made the introductions, made the rounds, introducing us all and putting us in touch. 
Um, you know, Zucky wrote, uh, like I love Zucky's reviews, but Zucky wrote this great review for the film in the San Francisco Chronicle. If you haven't checked it out, I, I, I definitely encourage you to do so. Um, but you know, even Zucky, you know, and I'll say this and, and I'll, I'll even ping him that I, that, that I said this on the show, but he says the second half bounces viewers through major events in the characters' lives. And then he puts something in quotes that's a little bit of a spoiler, so I'll leave it. Too fast, losing the singular poetic impact of the earlier portion. And then he ends with, like, again, a, a very glowing review. So that's no, that's not really a critique. But I'm like, hey, Zucky, you kind of missed the plot. Yeah. Like, to me, yeah. the fact that it does feel so uh, rapid, the second half, is deliberate because... Like you, all the beautiful things you just said, Zishan. Yeah, absolutely. And it was like, um, you know, we got, we get, sometimes right. people watch the film and they say that, like, even if it's like not through a critical lens, they're just like, suddenly, like so much happened, like, like all of a sudden, like so much life happened in the back half of your film, or you pit, how did you fit so much sort of like turning points? And it was kind of like, um that isn't that how life is like when you look back at your life like you're like where did the last five years of my life go like you know we're all living through the pandemic and we're reflecting on you know it's been a year or two years and we're just kind of like it feels like that but then also you're like what what happened with the last six months of my life like I know that there were difficult things I know there was loss I know that uh, I celebrated these certain things, but it all feels like you're suspended in this timeless state. And that is really what life is like. And so I think like for us, we feel very sort of like we we kind of like set out with that intention. And I think people like Aman said, like people bring their own set of experiences, their own perspective and their own takeaways. And, you know, sometimes we meet people where they are and sometimes they sort of like maybe miss where we are. But I think like that's the beautiful thing about this film is I think you can kind of latch on to different parts of the storytelling and maybe you resonate with the very sort of intimate details, but maybe you resonate with the sort of ways in which life becomes fluid and like things kind of get messy and things get complicated. And we hold both of those things. The, the first half of the film, the second half of the film, we hold with sort of like equal love ourselves, but it's kind of like you need both because like life is about that. Life is about the simple moments and it's also about the moments of difficulty and joy and sadness and, time passing by and all of those. Yeah. Uh, uh, Aman, uh, like I, I, I want to kind of, tr you know, transition the conversation into uh, whenever we talk about art, more of the mundane aspects of it, which is like, okay, you know, how did the movie get funded? You know, like uh, what do you expect from the movie, you know, and things like that. And I want to definitely get into that, but um, I, I, I guess I, for you, Aman, I, I'd love to kind of hear like, what was your involvement? Like, again, maybe even for those who are un uninitiated into the whole process, like what is the role of a, of a, of a, of a, of a producer versus the role that Zishan played as the film's director? So the way I always frame it is a producer helps. So you are dealing with the more mundane so parts of if, the art. Uh, my brother. Absolutely. So everything I'm, I'm dealing with all the mechanics and the logistics. So like coordinating shoots making sure we get funding, doing networking, uh, building buzz, publicity, all of the mechanics of it uh, so that I can take that off Zishan's plate so Zishan can focus on how beautiful this film should be, how his vision is. Okay, okay, great. And uh, I, and, and I want to come back to that, like I said, because I, I, you know, uh, like Justin talked about it. I mean, even we had like Lena Khan on just this last month, you know, and she just got off of directing and helming like a Disney production, but like her first film was like Tiger Hunter, which was a completely, you know, like crowdsourced and crowdfunded sort of project, not completely, but you know, a big chunk of it. Um, so I want to talk about that because that's also very real. Whenever we talk about Muslim art and Muslim cultural production, yep. like people forget and, you know, there's not enough attention given to the kind of, like you said, the mechanics and, and, and some of those other aspects of it as well. But I guess before we leave kind of the more thematic and artistic parts of the film, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a huge music guy. And, sure. and, and, and one of the things I, I, I do pride or I do really enjoy listening to is film scores. And so there is a score, there is music happening, not just hip hop music that uh, Hanif is jiving out to, uh, but also there is a score. And I'm, and I know at the end, um, 
and I'm and, I, and you have to excuse me, I didn't write his name down, but there is a composer and so on. But if you could t- kind of talk about like, did is this like an original piece? Uh, and if it is, like, I, you know, I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah, we worked with an incredible composer um, based in New York. His name is Michael Bahari, um, and he um, it, all of the music is original score um, we developed for this film. And um, all of these themes that we're talking about, I mean, Michael did a very incredible job just like listening to sort of like my, uh, the film, but then my sort of just like gibberish of like, oh, like life and death and uh, intimacy and casket shop and textures and water. I was just like throwing all of these like terms at him. And he was like, okay. Um, And so we then started like building a palette of sound and we really experimented with instrumentation was so important. Like I personally don't like any, there was this like trend in the documentary world for like a while of like very (laughs) ambient sounding music, like very sort of like, um, explosions in the sky like very sort of like you're floating like totally you're floating right. I've, I've space, heard yeah sort exactly of, um energy um and i connected with michael because i heard one of his scores and it had this beautiful saxophone like i heard a, a like something that he put together and it was this rich kind of thing it felt like somebody was playing a saxophone on a street corner it was like so immediate and i was like who is this guy i was like who is this guy i need to meet him and we started playing with textures and this film is so textural visually. I mean, you have the washings, you have the casket shop and we wanted all of the instrumentation to sort of like reflect that in some sort of way. Um, But the actual genesis of the film, the score um, Mm. happens at the beginning of the film where you hear the Adhan being called. um, And it's done by this brother in Newark, his name is Mustafa. And it's done in a way that like I've never heard before. Like his voice is incredible it's so wild it's so beautiful um and we heard that in the filming process and we always knew that we like we loved it so much that we like opened the film essentially with it because we were like this is so beautiful this has to be done and michael had this really sort of brilliant idea where he was like let's set the key of all of our instruments to mustafa's voice like we will have the uh, his voice be the representative sort of thematic undertone. So even though we're playing with all of these different instruments, I mean, we have French horn and saxophone and um, clarinets and the organ. I thought I heard more, but I could be wrong. These very sort of textural instruments. Yeah. There's an organ at the very end. Like we played with sort of like instruments that had, because I was like, I don't want a piano. Like I was like, because pianos feel too sort of like floating in space. I want something that, you can feel the keys being pressed. I want the harp so you can like feel each pluck of the sort of like instrument. And then Michael was like, well, you, you're so impacted by this man's voice. Like, let's use that as a sort of like haunting sort of like undertone that you're holding all of these things. And so the score is, even though we're playing with all of these instruments, I hope at least when you're listening to it, I mean, when I listen to it, I, I just love hearing the sort of like, the journey of sound in this film. Like you're really kind of taken on this wild journey in the same way. Like there's such visual language, but there's such detailed, rich kind of like palettes of sound that I think we worked on developing. And that's much credit to Michael, who's just like a brilliant composer. And and not only that, horns are very often in Islam mm. and in, in many faiths are used as uh, instruments of calling. And this is a film about calling in Allahi and Allahi Rajun. And so, and people, ad- answering their calling on this earth and so there is lots of layers wow yeah there's definitely you, a lot you just of got me, you had me in this like ecstatic moment uh amon like it was like preach brother preach like it was just it was, it was beautiful um and 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 i'm so glad i asked that question zishan because i could tell that you too are a real sort of aficionado of music and, and really appreciate what it does uh to to a to a visual piece of art um and i, I so thank you so much for kind of going into that detail and i'll i'll, I'll, I'll this is just like sort of a confession, like there was a part and I can't remember where it was because I, I but I made a note of it because then I, because I was like, okay, I want to ask about the score. And then more specifically, there's this moment where, and I think it is the organ. And while it's playing in my mind, I found myself almost humming uh, the words to my hometown by Bruce Springsteen. Like, I don't think it's delivered because you said this is all original music, but 
I was like, wouldn't that be amazing? Because uh, you're talking about New Jersey. You can't get any more New Jersey than Bruce Springsteen, right? Like the boss, man. So it was like, but there's this, there's, this, and I, I'm, I'll even like maybe cat, like go back and listen for it, and I'll tell you where it is. So maybe you, you could either, you know, tell me if I'm completely out of my mind or whatever, because it's, it's so evocative of the kind of haunting, of that haunting song of Bruce Springsteen, which is called My Hometown. But um, anyway, that's neither here nor there either, um, unless you had a comment about that. No, I mean, I maybe <laughs> subconsciously we were listening to there you uh, go. Bruce Springsteen and I, it kind of I like made it. its way into the yeah. score, like said, you know, it, it, so who knows? Right, whether it was Michael deliberate or not, I mean, you, you, you couldn't help but, like, kid. right? I mean, Jersey is, is infused into the boss and the boss is infused into Jersey. So, yeah. Um, and, and, you know, you mentioned the Adan and my wife and I saw the movie together, by the way, and she, and she also loved it. Um, but... We uh, we talked about the Adhan and, you know, there is almost this sort of juxtaposition, if you will, between the Adhan that's called and then we hear the, 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 the Quran being recited by what I assume is an imam from the Middle East because, you know, he speaks, you know, he's reciting it in that very classical sort of traditional, you know, uh, sort of, you know, uh, rhythm. But the Adhan, even though it sounds... It's not, you know, the way the tradition, the Adhan is called in the traditional Muslim world. It is so authentic and it is so rich and beautiful and quintessentially American. Because the only time other than in your film that I've heard that is a particular mosque right here in Oakland that I attend, where the person who calls the Adhan, the Muaddin, you know, uh, recites it or calls the Adhan in very much the same kind of like, you know, that kind of melody and almost like they're singing it. Uh, and so, you know, to me, that's just evocative of a very kind of black Muslim American kind of uh, cultural production. And I, and I, I embrace it wholeheartedly. And it's so beautiful because it is in your film as well. Um, I guess, I, I guess if we can then sort of think about concluding, um, we, yeah, I mean, and, and I guess maybe this would be a place for you to comment, Zishan, and, and then what I promised you, Aman, to kind of talk more about, like a little bit about the mechanics, and then we'll 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 we'll, we'll, we'll wrap the conversation. Um, is that sure. you know yep. The, yep. the 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 audience is seeing you know American Islam, you know, in this really organic and natural way like we're seeing a slice of american life we're seeing a life of a slice of american muslim life and i i think that's so beautiful um the, like i have to ask like the mosque in new excuse me in newark in particular like it's this is grand edifice like can you tell us uh, can you tell a bit uh, uh, can you tell us a little bit more about maybe the history of the mosque or of the muslim community in newark as you i probably learned yourself during the course of the filmmaking Please. Sure, absolutely. And there's a lot uh, to say about it. So this Muslim community in Newark that has been there for several decades, um, maybe even back to like the, the 20s and 30s. And there's obviously goes all the way. And if you know anything, but historically uh, with Malcolm X and the Nation of Islam, Newark was one of the big hubs of the uh, black American Muslim community. And as a matter of fact, there's a lot of OGs in, in fact, there. In Jersey, I, I, I'm sorry, Jersey. I don't mean to cut you off. Like so, it, it even predates... Fact, like the history of Islam in the black American community, it predates Malcolm even. It goes back to like sort of the early, like other proto-Islamic yeah. movements that don't get mentioned, so. uh, you know, beyond the nation of Islam. Very much so. Absolutely, very much so. And and since then, um, Newark is a fascinating community because it's so Muslim. Like, it, it's just not even funny. Like the mayor is Muslim city council is Muslim. Everybody in Newark has a, a family member that's Muslim, like for the most part. It's just how it is. And so it's just so integrated within the community. And it really reflects itself, um, it, you know, in the film is you hear the, um, in this little neighborhood, this mosque, you hear the Adan is being blasted on the street corner. Um, and you, you hear it over and over again. And yeah, it's it's just a part of uh, people's lives, and it, it's it, it was 
to me, it was just something I just really appreciated about it is there's just this, even if you're not Muslim, there's just this adherence and there's this reverence and respect uh, for the community. And what was also interesting is no matter who you are and what your practice is or how little you know or how much you know, mm. you just find ways of making Islam work for you. You may not be the most fluent person in Arabic. You may not know all the dialects, but maybe you have a musical background like this more than here who is a, uh, uh, he was a, isn't, was it Mustafa a jazz singer, Zishan? Wow. Yeah, he was a jazz yeah. singer. Um, and he was trained in traditional jazz. And so his Adhan reflects what he knows. And he looks at uh, the, the Adhan the way he looks at a composition. Um, and so it's based on people's experiences. They just make Islam beautiful uh, uh, work for them. Yeah. Uh, Zishan, I can't see you, but like if you had any thoughts or that you wanted to add to that, I mean, I'd love to hear anything. Yeah, I mean, Aman said it so well, but I think, it, you know, it really is like Islam is so kind of like woven into the fabric of like the daily lived experience. Um, you know, all of the businesses on the street corner, like half of them are owned by like Muslim, you know, business owners. You know, the restaurant right next to the mosque is owned by this incredible sister named uh, uh, Razi, who like runs the feeds everyone in the community. You know, there's just like there, it just is a part of like the community care um, at every single kind of everywhere you turn. I mean, there's just like some Muslim event, some Muslim planned um, something. And I think one of the things that I also love is like when Hanif's niece um, is kind of talking about his sort of um, past towards the beginning of the film, she says this is a very simple thing, but I think it kind of speaks to the sort of like how woven in and she's kind of like, um, you know, yeah. like he turned his life okay. around and um, Allah or God or whatever sort of higher power above. And it so simply kind of shows like, this is a mixed faith family. Like Islam is just like, whatever your God is, it's like, whatever your God is, whatever, whoever you worship, like, you know, we're still family. Like, it, like that doesn't really matter. And that is so authentic to like how things are in Newark, we talked about our earlier experiences growing up. Like we grew up in the Midwest. Like it wasn't like that. Like even though we knew Christian people and Jewish people, it was like we were speaking different languages. We were coming from different experiences. It was really like different versus in, in Newark and in East Orange. It was really about like we're family. Like we, I, it doesn't matter what God you pray to. Like, you know, this, this, everyone's like, it's all God. Like it's all God at the end of the day. Like we're, we're all the same. We're all kind of united by the same sort of experiences and where we come from. So, you know, we're going to love each other. We're going to take care of each other. And I think that is really what makes the, the, the Muslim community in Newark so uh, yeah, I, I couldn't agree. And, and, so and just a wonderful setting ways. to the film. I mean, you know, uh, and, and, and kudos to sort of seeking, you know, seeking out that location because, you know, what I think what you were describing, you know, without getting, too sociological or technical here is is very much kind of an indigenization process where you know islam has indigenized itself into that community whereas you know in places like i grew up places like you grew up we're seeing that happen but it hasn't already happened and what you see in places like jersey and philadelphia and in atlanta and the south side of chicago you see where Islam has really become indigenized uh, into the fabric of that community. Um, and so, yeah, like you said, it's, it's people just see it as, 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 as part of, you know, Newark people just see it as part of Southside Chicago. So um, that fascinating again, just because it, you know, it, it is, I think so telling of um, and so beautiful about the whole sort of American Muslim narrative as well, even though we happen to be focusing on a predominantly black you know, uh, black Muslim community there. Um, so, uh, I guess I'm on, if, if you want, like, I'd love to kind of hear the journey that takes place for you as a producer to not only kind of, you know, again, get the wheels in motion for a project like this, but then throughout to keep the lights on. And then what are you kind of looking at now that the film is releasing? Yeah. Sure. Yeah. yeah. And so there's no way to sugarcoat it. Making a film is hard. It is very, very hard and very, very uh, expensive, uh, to be quite frank. And it was um, it's a it's a it was a process. It, it was a grind. It was a hustle. And for us, especially as first time filmmakers, understandably so, there's not people are going to be willing to be like, OK, it's a cool idea. But can you deliver? 
right? And so there were many people early on that um, we said no to us initially. Uh, we were at a little bit of an advantage because, because we were filming only 20 or 30 minutes away. Uh, and it was mostly myself and my brother, at least during the days of production. Um, we had a little bit of a nimble crew, and so we didn't really have too many significant expenses. So we were able to be a little bit nimble earlier on. Um, and then slowly but surely, we had footage and we had samples. We could show people. Then we started getting some grants. And then once this organization came on board, and then this organization came on board. So we got a lot of support from folks at the Tribeca Film Institute, um, ITVS, which is a funding arm of PBS, uh, the Ford Foundation, uh, and a couple other groups. And so slowly but surely, things happened. And I think, and I, this is what I will tell um, any artist, any filmmaker, yeah, honestly, anybody who's applying for things, it could even be a uh, nonprofit world. Um, when somebody is saying no to you, it's not that they don't think your project is good. They're simply saying, I have, this is what I'm looking for. And what you're proposing to me does not fit my criteria of what I'm looking for. Doesn't mean that they don't like you. Doesn't mean they don't like your project. They're simply saying, this is not a fit. That said, you may disagree, you may push, keep pushing and this or that. Um, and so we never t held grudges. When somebody said no or this or that, I said, okay, they're just simply saying, they're not saying this film isn't good or that we're not good. They're just saying, this is my narrow parameters of what I'm looking for in a project. And this is, this doesn't fit that. And so, and not only telling a story, because we live in a capitalist society, you also have to demonstrate an audience. You have to show why people want to watch this film and who is your audience. Um, and that's what we had to do as well. Show that who who's going to see this film. What do we want to do with this film? Uh, and I always tell filmmakers, it's definitely have a vision. You want to tell a great story, but you also want to show who are you trying to reach with this? Because the answer of oh, I want to reach as many wide people as possible. Sure, we all want to do that. But who are your die hard core people that are going to come out and want to support uh, this project? Um, and and we were just very fortunate as well because in making this film, we also did a lot of filmmaker labs. And so Tribeca, which gave us a grant, had a filmmaker retreat that we did. Uh, a couple other organizations, Sundance did uh, a great lab for us uh, and other organizations. So we were learning because this is our first film. We had a lot of established filmmakers along the way that uh, helped us. And there's people that we emailed out of the blue and say, hey, I loved your film and you seem to have dealt with this challenge that we're dealing with. Can you get on the phone for like 10 minutes? We just have a question. They'll be like, yeah, sure. And so we got stuck many times along the way uh, and we just picked people's brains. Um, and that said, like we understand the grind now and we salute it. And um, we were just very fortunate that we had so many people along the way to help us out in, in, in making this film. And so now, yeah, to your last question about what are we doing now it's getting this film out into the world. Um, it's wanting people to see it. And what we're also doing is um, we're partnering with organizations around the country uh, to do our impact campaign. And what we're looking to do is um, we realize from not only our own experiences, but also through filming is how grossly underprepared people are when it comes to talking about death. And what we're doing is what we're calling um, death preparation workshops where not only are you going to watch the film, uh, but we're going to help you put together uh, a healthcare directive. So if you, for whatever reason, uh, become inca incapacitated on a ventilator, what is your family going to do in that situation? Um, do you have a will? Do you have health life insurance? Do you have this? Do you have that? We want to normalize these conversations because when it comes to losing a loved one, and we all will experience it at every at every moment, at every we'll all experience it. We want to make sure that you have these conversations now because when you grieve, and I know this from we know this from experience, the last thing you want to worry about is paperwork. We're trying to figure out uh, what did mom want, what did dad want, what did our grandmother want, uh, what are their wishes. We want to have these conversations now. We know they're uncomfortable. We know it's awkward and it's depressing to talk about. We understand that, but it's important to normalize these conversations because many of us don't have them, and by the time these moments happen, it's the most stressful thing, one of the most stressful things that you'll ever have to deal with. And so while there's no easy way to grieve, 
We want to take all the bureaucratic so paperwork out of the um, way so people can You know, uh, Aman and Zishan, you know, like you, I lost my father. Um, and, you know, uh, it was just a mere months before he died because he had failing health that he sat me down and, and my and some of the other members of the family and kind of went over by reading, literally reading from his will, like end of life decisions. And that proved to be that proved to be so prescient because where his health took him, you know, we had that we were at that juncture where we had to make a call in terms of end of life. And so because he was on a ventilator and and, uh, you know, but having like it was almost like I could literally hear his voice in my head. It was so reassuring and it made that part of it so much easier than it would have been, uh, which is difficult regardless, but just having that. And so for you to be able to like for you to use this film as an opportunity to facilitate these conversations in the community, I, I just that is so commendable, guys. Um, you know, that is amazing. And, and you know, Godspeed to you, too, in, you know, uh, you know, and all the success that the movie can build, uh, that the film can bring. And also, you know, to enable these kind of conversations to occur. Um, you know, one last thing I want to say, you know, uh, going kind of moving backwards a little bit to what you just talked about, Aman. You know, the good thing is and I've seen this from as someone who's been involved from from uh, in, uh, in the nonprofit space. What we're beginning to see is kind of a maturation in Muslim organizational growth in the in the community in America. And so what, what we're seeing is while at the same time we're seeing this kind of real burgeoning renaissance, if you will, of uh, and growing, uh, you know, uh, of art and cultural production. And, you know, I talked about Justin earlier and I remember one of the comments Justin made was exactly what you just talked about, which is you know, hey guys, you know, if someone picks up the phone and calls you up and wants like either some advice or where to go, you know, don't just like be so territorial and, and you know, just offer a helping hand, you know, and just, just listen to what they have to say, listen yeah. to their idea, you know, and, and he talked about that. And I think, you know, both of you, I think you and Justin kind of talked or speak of that from shared experiences. Um, but what, what I will say is happening is, and this is really welcome news, is you're seeing kind of a maturation of the Muslim community about philanthropic growth. And so you're having like, for example, you mentioned like, you know, the Ford Foundation, uh, you know, and others, you, you're beginning to see that kind of foundational development in the Muslim community. So you've got like the Pillars Fund and, and other such organizations that are pooling resources to fund exactly the kind of projects like Two Gods, like filmmakers actual content producers, cultural producers, and so on. So uh, we're seeing that while we're also seeing, like I said, this real, um, uh, this real, you know, growth in cultural production coming from Muslims. So I think it's, I think it's beautiful. And I'm really hopeful to where the direction of the Muslim community is. Absolutely. And, you know, we're super thrilled by it. And it's, right. a, it's a shout out to people that were just fed up and frustrated and demanded that we have seats at the table. Like you mentioned uh, Pillars uh, and the Ford Foundation. I don't know if you saw the announcement that came yeah. out uh, today. They've exactly. started this new joint fund to support Muslim creatives. Because That's it, came right. from, it literally came from a speech that Riz Ahmed gave um, at an award ceremony to talk about how frustrated he was about the lack of representation of Muslim Americans in cinema. And Ford was in the audience like, yo, let's do something. And Pillars was there like, yeah, let's do something. And it was... People fighting relentlessly behind the scenes and demanding that um, this be supported. And so we would be remiss to not shout out all the people behind the scenes. Like as many filmmakers as we need, we need more executives, philanthropists, funders, um, grant writers, you know, to, to make this happen because we can complain all we want, but people aren't going to give things to us. We're going to have to demand that we belong. That's beautiful. Uh, and that uh, and I hope I, I hope that that also kind of the, the the way we're seeing these coalesce this coalescence of different talents coming together. I hope we also see that among the creatives because I think, like I said, I mean it'd be great for you guys, like you, the creative people, you know, who or storytellers and you know authors who can all come together and you know collaborate, you know collaborate or just bounce off ideas. Like I, I hope the workshops and things like that, like you mentioned Tribeca, like in what they're doing, Tribeca is doing, like, I would love to see that kind of happening, those type of laboratories happening, labs happening in the Muslim community. So, and I hope they are. And if they're not, then I think there's really a, a, a real potential there for, for creating these type of spaces.
Yeah, I mean, I'm I'm really hopeful that that is going to be the next wave. Like, it, it it's like we're in this wave now where I think a lot of people are, like you said, like getting more sort of like their footing more solid. Um, we have more creatives breaking through. Um, you know, gaining sort of access to more power in the industry. I mean, like, and I think the second you pay it forwards is the second you're creating sort of like generational development. And I think that is what like. I'm hopeful for the next wave of Muslim storytellers and Muslim creators. And it's like those storytellers need to be sort of uplifted by this current generation of storytellers. Like that is really like what we're seeing happening. And it's so exciting to see these sort of announcements come to fruition because it reaffirms the fact that like, this isn't um, a one-off thing. This like generation of, you know, filmmakers or artists that like, you know, my brother and I like to think that we're a part of right now, like kind of like pushing the needle a little bit, like that's just the beginning. Like the real sort of change happens when those filmmakers support the new class of filmmakers. And then those filmmakers come up under the guidance of that sort of like mentorship. Like that's the real sort of like the goal that we definitely have in mind too. So hopefully that is happening already. And yeah, it's going to happen God more willing. and more and, and uh, become more normalized. So I, I asked this as a fan, uh, what do you, you know, what's slated for you next uh, guys? Uh, what, what, you know, any, if you can tease us with any sort of projects that you are thinking about that sort of the seed is, you know, like it's that, that ideas that are percolating or maybe germinating already. <laughs> um, our next project is a vacation. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> We've been working on this for five years or six years, um, but we're, we're brewing something. We're always we always got something in the works. Yeah. But once this film is properly out and this sure, campaign definitely. is done, we're gonna take some time to unpack and give ourselves that space that is well learned. So, well so tell our listeners how they can support uh, you right now, and then Absolutely. tell our listeners where people can find you uh, and engage you, uh, as I'm sure they would love to do that. Sure, multiple ways. Uh, Two Gods Film on Instagram. You can follow us there uh, and watch the film, twogodsfilm.com. Uh, and it's also airing on PBS on uh, June 21st. And outside the Excellent. United States, uh, you can watch on Vice. And one thing, and one quick thing about the PBS sort of broadcast for anyone who's listening, like, uh, it is actually important that Muslim audiences mobilize to support these stories. Like we've had conversations behind the scenes. Like the reason why so few Muslim stories get funded in sort of broadcast spaces is because there's this belief that like Muslim audiences don't tune in um, and like as a sort of concerted energy. So like if you see a Muslim film, not just ours, if you see a Muslim film at the box office, go opening weekend. If you see a film that's kind of uh, airing on broadcast, tune in opening night um, and get, kind of like help the viewership because that is going to be the thing that also generates change behind the scenes is showing that Muslim audiences will show up and support stories. So call to action, not just for our film, but anytime you see a Muslim film, even if you're not even that excited to see it, like buy a ticket for it, uh, tune in, um, you know, like just do show support in that way because viewers and box office that holds power to make this a sustainable change in our industry. Every studio will say, if it don't make dollars, it don't make sense. And yeah. that's the truth. And until you demonstrate that there is an audience to watch it, um, yeah, that, that's what you uh, have to do. You that, have to go that's out awesome. and show that, I, I love that quote. Um, so thank you, guys. I, I cannot thank you enough. I know we went almost two hours here, but it was a fascinating conversation. I hope it was for you as well. Uh, I, okay, great. I hope you found... Um, yeah, like I, yeah, I, I just, I, like I said, I wish you Godspeed and all the success that the film can bring. Um, and then your further collaborations and then also to your endeavors individually as well. Uh, as always, listeners, um, if you have any questions, your thoughts, your comments, your feedback, we always welcome them. You can send it the old fashioned way. And I say old fashioned, you know, good old email, diffusecongruence at gmail.com. You can hit us up on facebook.com slash diffusecongruence. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, if you want to become a monthly patron and support podcasts like this and support ours specifically, go to patreon.com slash diffusecongruence, become a patron of the show. And we would hope to continue to bring great content like the conversation we just had. And uh, thank you listeners as always for listening and catch us next time on the next episode of Diffuse Congruence.
Mm-hmm. <laughs>